Texting. 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 Mark Will and Tomek present Texting. Hello all you textual deviants and welcome to another episode of Texting. I'm Mark Will in Taipei. And I'm Tomek in Moscow. Hare Krishna. Uh, and to you too. <laughs> Today we want to focus on George Carlin's special It's Bad For You. Now this uh, was released in 2008 uh it's carlin's last hbo special which is why i wanted to focus on it and uh it was recorded four months before his death so when he recorded it he was 70 then he turned 71 died and then was reborn the, then the well he was reborn <laughs> on HBO when this special was released. Before we get into the special, It's Bad For You Though, I want to share a quote from Ezra Pound, and then I have a question about it. Great. Ezra Pound says, artists are the antennae of the race. Now, does this statement apply to stand up comedians comics are they artists or can they be artists in the same way that pound is presumably talking about you know visual artists and and uh poets and so forth so can we dissect the word antenna a little bit okay so i presume it can mean like something that's picking up things that are going on but it can also be something that's guiding, right? So it's it can be both receptive and something that, yeah, that is pointing a direction. What do you? I think? hadn't thought of, I hadn't thought about the latter meaning, but yeah, is that do insect antennae do that? They help guide the the flying I creature. I think so or? because they're kind of like sensing, like they're sticking them out to see. I I, I always thought of it as like a probe in a way, you know, like. Uh, like almost like a cane for a blind person. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, makes sense. I, the, you know, when every time I've I've uh, considered this quotation, I've thought about this the receptivity okay. and kind of I th I thought in terms of like a, a an almost prophetic function too. You know that maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think uh, Pound is saying that artists pick up on things, perceive things that the rest of the race, the human race, uh, is oblivious to. Uh, and so they're, they're sensitive in a way to, to, uh, things that are going on now and possibly in the future. And, and they're sensitive in a way that maybe the rest of us are not. Well, there's no question for me that they should be considered in that category and i think uh as i get the older, great ones the yeah, great ones yeah right? sure sure but yeah. i mean as i get older i feel like comedians are more and more vital because uh this is probably commonly accepted as truth now but with the kind of dissolution or our our ability to kind of see through what the mainstream news does now it's we know we rely on comedians to kind of give us reality in many times when we, when we think about situations like jimmy Dore and russell brand coming to prominence it's kind of and right and, and before that stuff like the daily show it's like uh true yes. yeah we need we need comedy to to help us navigate these muddy and uh warped times and uh you know would these shows that you're talking about even be possible 
if if Carlin had not been doing what he did, you know, for decades before they appeared on the scene. I mean, not only Carlin, but sure. I would I would say him in particular. I mean, I think you which, are much more familiar with Carlin's legacy. I've kind of tried to pump myself with as much information as I as I could the last few days, but uh, mm -hmm. as far as his overall effect on the cultural landscape, I think you could speak to that better. Maybe, maybe, but before we before we get into that, I want to ask, since this is a question that has been on people's minds, it seems, lately, who is the goat? Who is the greatest of all time? <laughs> okay. So, if we're talking, if we're talking about stand-up comedians, comics, who's on your list? All right. Do you just want my number one, or do you want my top five? Well, either way, share what you want to share. All right, but I've decided to take liberties and include just general comedians. Sure. Okay. Like so, sketch, sketch comedians. Yeah, or? I mean, you'll see. There's only one okay. that really stands out, or one and possibly two who stand out for more that they're. they're television influence but uh, okay so i've got in number in first place i've got larry david uh, okay yeah just because of how much i adore curb um mm -hmm. but also like obviously leading into seinfeld as well and then i've got and these let's say no particular order besides maybe the larry david uh right. so then i've got dave Chappelle. um who doesn't necessarily always make me laugh out loud. And I would say that his past few specials haven't like blown me away, not because they've offended, but I just feel like they're a bit heavy handed to some extent. I would, exactly. That's what I was going to say. That's why, I mean, he is definitely one of the greatest for me personally, but he's, he's not the greatest because I think he's become a bit too preachy for my taste. Now I'm gonna watch every single thing he does. Like that's I exactly always, it. Exactly. Yeah, it. I want to hear what he has to say because it's gonna be interesting, and he's gonna have a unique take, and it's gonna be there will be some hilarious moments as well. But uh, there, there's almost like a motivational speaker vibe that he's been giving off recently, which for I don't me, know about motivation. Somewhat, I would say more like spoken word, but fair enough. Yeah, it's just, I mean, at times it's off-putting to me, but I, I want to, I will definitely watch everything he does. Same with Bill Burr, you know, like I'm, I'm eager to hear what they have to say. I think they're important voices. I want to listen to them. I mean, but I think keep the going. flavor, no, I just think that maybe the flavor of comedy, or at least in certain threads of comedy it's like now we're almost interested yeah just in what this person's going to opine about something so it's like dave Chappelle is just now like a cultural figure he's a commentator as much as he is a comedian right and it's like yeah so maybe that's the whole new genre we need to t consider in a different way but anyway okay next up i've got george carlin uh yeah just because of the the feeling that you're you're in the audience of a uh, master, I mean, you, the the amount of skill, the amount of effort, and I know we're gonna get much deeper into Carlin, but yeah, just that would say the thing that stands out is like his expertise uh, and just how how crafted his work is. Yeah, he's so, a craftsman. Yeah. Then I've got Ricky Gervais, who actually I'm not a huge, huge fan of to be honest, but because he made The Office, which I think is like the greatest thing ever created, ever in comedy. Uh, for me, he just gets that place because of the office. I thought you, I thought you were going to include him. Yeah. What do you think about his Oscar? Uh, his hosting. hosting. I like it yeah. as well. Not, know. not. It's not always Oscar, is it? It's Golden Globes or right. some shit. I like it. Like anytime he hosts an award show. Actually, that's how I got into him. Like I'd never got into the office, despite your recommendations. Did you try? I've seen some episodes. I just, uh, I don't know. Maybe I should give it another chance. But when I saw him uh, destroying at those award shows, I became a fan. Like, I mean, it's so good. Yeah, I agree. It's so good. But anyway, continue. <laughs> and my last one, who I've been binging on now, and I think you might be able to guess just from that, uh, but it's Norm MacDonald. And, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So, I well, wouldn't have said I, that a few years ago, but since he right. died, I got fed a bunch of his videos on my algorithm, and then I don't know why, but they've been popping up again, and I just go on super long deep dives, and it's kind of like this incredulous sensation because I, yeah, he's pushing the boundary so much, and he's I can't decide if sometimes if I'm slightly offended, but that's like that's the fascination that draws me in in a way. Well, that's the that's what the great comedians do. They they force us to confront these unpleasant issues and they find the humor in them. Maybe, but <clears throat> I would just say that I mean, we can talk about Norm. I don't know if you want to talk about it now as well, but I'd say it's a different I wouldn't say it's like a a necessary requirement of a great comedian. I would just say that's like that's his brand, you know? Like uh, yes, I I mean, I agree. It's not like Jerry Seinfeld. Right, exactly. That's exactly makes us think, right. Right. Yeah, or I don't know. Uh what what's the younger version of Seinfeld, Mark Normand or whatever. I mean, I I watch them too, of course. They're they're entertaining, but they don't uh they don't push the same buttons that these others do. Yeah, I mean, I'm just and, thinking about the way that like Norm Macdonald like deals with race, with gender. I mean, he does he says stuff that I question, like whether I should really laugh. Yeah, there's right? some. He, he seems he seems to be promoting some odious views at times, but you don't know is it is he just putting you on or exactly is he doing which it? is right? Yeah, which is you know this is a great thing. I like I like uh, this uh, confrontation or or provocation i guess he's provoking the audience and he's he's almost daring the audience to laugh it's like right or like see. the holocaust it's, humor right it's the same thing yeah is it am i am i joking or not right actually this is a a theme i'm going to plug my latest project but my new book okay is called earnest games and so it's uh that's coming out soon but one of the themes is you know is it is it a game or is it serious? Uh, am I in earnest or am I just joking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, I think the, the great comedians, uh, operate in this realm and, you know, sometimes they cross the line, they find the line. Actually, we were looking earlier at a Carlin quote, uh, or a Carlin interview on the Chris Rock show. And he was talking about, he likes to find the line and then mm -hmm. go over the line and take the audience yeah. with him. It was interesting the way which, he said that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great thing. And then I'm just going to share some of my Please. top, I don't know, five or six. Please. I, I, for me, I think Carlin is, is number one if we have to rank, but you know, Richard Pryor is in the mix. Uh, for me, Chris Rock is Chris Rock because, gets an honorable mention for me because from you know I he was coming up when I was a teenager. He's probably only a few years older than me, and I remember seeing some of his first sets, and I thought this guy is hilarious. Oh yeah, if we're talking about early Chris Rock, that's what I that's like the fundamental stand-up comedy that I grew up on. It's just that like, I feel like he's he's fallen off a little bit. Well, uh, he did a special called Tambourine recently, which I quite enjoyed. I thought it was uh, very entertaining. And Yeah, but and, does it have the same level of just, like, vigor and ruthlessness that his earlier stuff did? Like, Bigger and, like, black, bigger and Blacker, was it? One of them? Yeah, and what, Bring the Pain and Kill the Messenger and whatnot. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe not, but it's, you know, he's... He's in a different place now. Well, that's he got the thing. Divorced. Yeah, exactly. He's yeah. He's a single dad, and uh, I don't know. I I still very much want to hear what he has to say. Uh, okay, and uh, Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks is one of the greats for me. I can't say too much about him, but I know he's hugely respected. Yeah, uh, and even though he was not that prolific, Patrice O'Neill. I'm glad you mentioned him because I was talking to my buddy Joe, you know, the guy I'm constantly referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
he did his top five, and then he got super frustrated with himself. He's like, oh, my God, I forgot Patrice O'Neill. And I don't even know that guy either, but obviously if both of you guys have mentioned him. Well, uh, check out his special Elephant in the Room. I mean, it is brilliant. I mean, I have i don't know how many times I've watched it. Like, I probably watch it a couple times a year, and I am like, in physical pain afterwards <laughs> because I'm laughing so hard. And yeah. he, and you know, he, he goes to uncomfortable places as well in such a masterful, brilliant way. And speaking of that kind of comedian, I have to mention Louis CK. Louis CK is on my honorable mentions. Yeah. Whom everyone now loves to hate, but, uh, his, you know, one of his recent specials, Sincerely, I listened to that again uh, last week, I think, and it's great. It's great. And he still retained a, ver a significant fan base, too, you know. I mean, he he's, def he's definitely still pretty massive. Sure. Yeah. But, I mean, he he doesn't give a fuck. He will, he will confront anything. And and the way he plays with the audience and and uh, his self deprecation. Yeah, I got to talk about self deprecation with him for sure. Yeah, I mean, I love it. Yeah, I do too. I do too. But maybe we should get into this special, which is actually our topic. Okay, I want to give out one more honorable mention because it's my top sure. honorable mention. It's to Key and Peele. Did you ever watch Key and Peele? Sure. Yeah. So just so many great sketches there. I mean, just like unbelievable number. And I think it's such a wide range of of characters that they can play. I mean, I just think the creativity is incredible, and it's some of the best, most enjoyable comedy I've watched like in the last five, ten years is their sketches. So, well, if we're talking sketch comedy, uh, I've got to mention Mr. Show uh, with uh, David Cross and Bob Odenkirk. Okay, you ever seen that? I know David Cross, but uh, yeah, no. Bob Odenkirk is now most famous for playing uh Saul Goodman in Better Call Saul but okay uh he got he he was a writer at SNL and uh he also did Mr. Show with David Cross which is I'll send you some clips it's okay. it's great uh and you know of course the the kings of sketch comedy Monty Python we might have to we might have to <laughs> do an episode just on Monty Python okay. or one of their movies or 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 uh, TV episodes. You're not a big Python fan? Uh, I just still feel on the outside. So oh. I've tried and like not really got into it, but you know, I I'm definitely willing to give it another shot because I I recognize its place in the pantheon. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get into It's Bad For You. Sure. Uh, it's significant that, as I mentioned before, it was the last show he recorded before his death because throughout he, well, I guess at the beginning, but this is sort of a, a theme throughout, he is now an old fuck, yeah. as he says. Not He's an, an old, old fuck. An not an old fart, not an old man. He says, you know, there are some people who are old men in their 20s. So I'm not an old man. I'm not an old fart. I'm an old fuck. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is this is what we've got. This is like the last hoorah of the old fuck. And, uh, you know, one of the I'll just call your attention to to a. I guess a catchphrase or a, a motif, light motif or or theme mm -hmm. that he revisits. I counted at least three times. Mm -hmm. He says, "It's all bullshit, folks. It's all bullshit, and it's bad for you." Yeah. So bullshit, and this is what he does, right? He has a bullshit detector, and he ruthlessly exposes the bullshit that. Uh, he sees he observes in the world and in particular as is common in his work the the united states i mean it's he's a commentator on the american scene 
much like I would say Mark Twain, uh, mm -hmm. and he did win the Mark Twain American Humor Award or whatever it's called. Uh, but this is what he does. He exposes bullshit. It's all bullshit, folks. It's mm -hmm. all bullshit and it's bad for you. He says, bullshit is the glue that holds us together as a nation. Yep. Yeah. Meaning, meaning the U S now mm -hmm. this is a, this is a, a theme that he also explores in, uh, his previous special, the one before it's bad for you, 2000, uh, five, 2006 is life is worth losing, which may be his greatest work. I think if I, you know, if I had to pick one special, I think I would say life is worth losing is is probably his masterpiece but it's the one i'm most familiar with but i again i plead fairly ignorant on his back catalog so i'd love well, to you go and, through his hbo specials a bit more at some point yeah well you and many others uh i i noticed that one bit from that special called dumb americans has over 20 million views on youtube i mean that is classic yeah that's that's the that one has the line about uh they call it the american dream because you have to be asleep to believe it yeah and, and that's that's the one with it's a big club and you ain't in it right right and uh, i think i maybe mentioned to you but i actually taught that to, to high school students and i had to do it with some disclaimers but it was uh it was a good way for me to kind of show a different perspective on the American dream yeah for these young children and just just the, what did they think about I it? think I also focus on the part about America being a shopping mall right and that, oh yeah and just how pristine America was when when America you know before America was settled on and uh, well as he says when it was stolen from the Indians and the Mexicans right right that whole monologue is just incredible it is incredible, uh, but let's let's try to focus on okay. it's bad for you. And if we sure, have time, we sure. can go back to life is worth losing. So what? I mean, what? Uh, other than what I've already touched upon, he's an old fuck calling out bullshit. What? What else can you say? What are your, imp your what are your impressions of it's bad for you in particular? Um, I'm really. I don't really feel like I can give too much specifics, and I feel like I apologize if I'm being negligent on that. I did listen, but I'm kind of more interested in just talking about him as a cultural figure. So we can come, you can come back to me, and you can add some more comments on the show, and then maybe I'll just speculate a little bit. I'll give some, I'll raise some questions about the man. Overall. Well, what do you think about the what do you think about the the setup and the the scene? You know, it's like in this special it's like we're in his living room with him right so it's like we we are visiting him you know what i'm saying the backdrop right i know he talks about kids right this is a significant section on kids no no did did you watch it or only listen uh, no i just listened oh okay yeah, yeah. so you don't know what i'm talking about there's a it's the you know the backdrop he's on the stage but it's like he's in his living room there's okay. a table there are a lot of books there's uh you know i guess there's a chair or something it looks like a living room so here we have this old fuck about to die and we're visiting him in his living room and he's just entertaining us for an hour but okay you didn't you didn't see the but man you can give your you know you can give your perspective, and I think that's interesting. Well, that's 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 all I want to say about it. It's it's very, uh, you know, it's not as theatrical as maybe Life Is Worth Losing, which was recorded in a in a. I assume it's a larger venue, and it's you know it's got like a more standardized uh, stand-up comedy special background so what what was special about it's bad for you is that it's it's just like it's made to look like we're hanging out with him in his living room and he's telling us stories and entertaining us and giving us warnings for the future in a way and and also giving us an assignment i love how at the end 
you know, the bit called You Have No Rights. He says, you have no rights, only temporary privileges, a, tempor a set of temporary privileges which can be taken away at any time. And he says, you don't believe me? Here's an assignment. Go look up. Go, he says, uh, you know, open up your computer, log on to the internet, go to Wikipedia, and type in Japanese Americans yeah, 1942. Right, right. Well, so I think that, in the other that, special, the what's the title? The it's life's not worth losing, or it's not worth life. Life is worth losing. Life is worth losing. Yeah, he's he, he extrapolates on a very similar vein when he he says, "Just look at how civilization will be if we pull out electricity." You know, like how how soon there'll be militias like at your door ready to rape your rape wife. your wife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's pretty dark. Yeah, it go, it's very dark, uh, very dark. I mean, we're we're getting into life is worth losing, but why not? We both listened to it yeah. again. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I've listened to different clips. Often they're, they just pop up as clips, not the whole set, you right. know. But right. as a set, I mean, life is worth losing. That is, that is masterful and probably, you know, probably his best work. Dumb Americans, extreme human behavior. I had to uh, take some breaks today listening because when he's getting into the the detailed description of uh, the auto, what is it when you masturbate and can auto erotic <laughs> asphyxia? Yeah, man. I just I don't know. It was it was hard to stomach because I just it was just <laughs> it was so detailed and uh, yeah. well. This I wanted to ask you about this. I mean, some of this, and and uh, you know, it's bad for you. And really, almost any of his of his stuff from say I don't know nineteen seventy something on. There's there's a a, a kind of nihilism or uh, misanthropy, mm -hmm. which I know is often problematic for you and something of a turnoff uh, for example i've been trying to get you to read e.m choron's the problem with being born and you tried and you said you you couldn't continue with it is that is was there something similar that you felt hearing this dark material but you could you could carry on with it because he makes it humorous yeah i think that's about right like uh in general, like if I feel like the social criticism is on point, then even if I feel like it lacks empathy, but I think that maybe it deserves to be ridiculed regardless. Like, let's say we're talking about like fat people. Well, I do think we should like be, you know, we should, we should look down on fat people, for example, but at the same time, being fat is an issue in America. So like I can... I can laugh along with that, right? Or I can just, or if if an image is just super funny, like, of course I'm gonna laugh. But when he's kind of going for a while without like a punchline, you know, it's just kind of it's just imagery, raw imagery, like the part that we just mentioned uh, about. I still can't pronounce it, but uh, Auto yeah, erotic yeah. I just asphyxia. I need I just I'm just saying I need some. I need a bit more. Of the humorous side, yeah, but well, in general, I mean, yeah, in general, these are some. Sorry, to keep going, but in general, these some these are some of my questions. It's just like, if you're someone in his position, there's kind of a a layer of authority that he possesses, right? Like I'm the guy who kind of is seeing through the bullshit. Like I'm I'm the guy in a way who's got it figured out. And maybe he wouldn't ever profess that, but I feel like his specials they're delivered with such kind of confidence and vigor, but at the same time, like you don't have it figured out. You know what I'm saying? Like you have a lot of issues with, with drug addiction. You, you haven't like had the most successful relationship and I'm not even judging. I'm just saying like for you then like, it's fine. Like you're, I'm no better than you, but you're the one who's like, so viciously attacking and all i'm saying is like if you're gonna attack for me the whole thing is like if you're gonna attack so hard like w you know what, what about the attack on yourself you know like if you're gonna attack religion to that extent 
Well, like, is your what's your recipe? Because like, yeah, that's all. Well, and that and that's interesting because self deprecation doesn't play as big a role in his shtick as it does in say Louis. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah, there's something to that, but I'm wondering. I mean, I think he would probably say, even though I'm speaking to you informally and in it's bad for you, it looks like we're in my living room. This is still an act, right? It's still a show. Yeah. I'm still performing and I'm wearing a mask. I'm playing this role of George Carlin, the old fuck who calls out bullshit. Right, right. You know, it's a performance. And I was going to say about the autoerotic asphyxia bit if you if you don't just listen to the audio if you watch the video he's he's gesturing all this time like he's jerking off you know pantomiming it i guess you could say and it's it's i don't know it's more humorous when you see what he's doing as he's delivering the <clears throat> the verbal part of the act you know what i mean yeah, I mean, and also, like, coming back to the misanthropic part, so he, you know, he often will, like, contrast humans with other animals, right? Like, that whole section about how humans are the only ones who murder, or humans are the only ones who, you know, and then he'll, he'll list a bunch of our worst traits. But it's like, that's still, I mean, it's clearly only part of the story, right? I mean, it's like... But the, don't you think this has an important uh, function sociologically or psychologically? Like this, it, he's taking the piss out of humanity, which, you know. No, that, and that's Ham usually important. Right. Yeah, that's as, the stuff that Hamlet, goes back to, yeah, that can go back to uh, God. Yeah. Well, as Hamlet says in a, in a mocking line, oh, man, the paragon of animals. I mean, that's how we think of ourselves or at mm -hmm. least that's our official conception of ourselves with all our propaganda and the you know the propaganda of the civilized world he he shows the discontents of civilization and he exposes the underbelly and punctures its its bloated sense of self-importance which i think is that's a necessary thing we need to have that For we sure. need to be reminded of that constantly otherwise we we get duped by you know rhetoric and and ideology and mass media bullshit so the fact that he cuts through all that is to me that he's providing a an invaluable service there yeah i mean that's where like the catharsis comes from right if we go back to like, it is a, uh, it is cathartic it is right. cathartic. That's, so if we go back to like the origins of what comedy can achieve yeah i mean and, and the relationship between comedy and tragedy is very present in his work right because it's like the tragic circumstances with his comic approach is like what what we find what we get relief from but i guess i'm just saying it's like i can handle it in certain in limited doses you know like if i'm if i'm walking home after school and I, you know i'm inevitably kind of tired and i just need to i need that kind of bitterness like that bitterness gives me like alleviates me like that's why i'll, I'll like often turn on a jimmy door video like when i'm tired after school but i won't listen to it like when i'm eating breakfast right so it's like if you it's don't want to start your day with that exactly rant. exactly exactly so that's all it's like it has its place <clears throat> But I'm just saying, yeah, as, yeah. as a worldview, like I don't endorse an approach to life. I would, I don't approach, I don't endorse that as an approach to life because I just don't feel like it would give me maximize my joy. <laughs> so that way. Right. Well, I'm just thinking, like, if he has to be resent, uh, relentless in that sense. That's the name of a Bill Hicks uh, album, I think. Relentless. He has to be relentless in that sense because just think if he ended it by saying oh they're all just jokes everybody i love you and everybody loves everybody and everything's going to be fine he he doesn't he doesn't give that carlin doesn't give that bill hicks doesn't really give that either although 
we can talk about that another time but he you know he's just like here's what i have to say uh take it or leave it yeah it's just I'm interesting not gonna, to i'm not gonna give you any comforting i'm not gonna tell you any comforting lies i'm not gonna pretend right, that right. we're headed in the right direction we are fucked we're doomed may as well enjoy it i mean i've seen uh interviews maybe larry king or something he's talking about he says and he's he says this he says this with complete resignation and acceptance he says you know like we're we're circling the drain meaning humanity mm -hmm. and he and there's another special where he says you know uh the earth is going to be fine we're the ones that are going to perish you know and and then the earth will go back to being the earth after this virus that is humanity has been removed mm -hmm. uh, the earth will cure itself of us basically mm -hmm. i mean does he does he really believe that uh it seems that he did you know like that was his sincere belief but he had a tougher uh, upbringing than i did for sure as well i mean that's can't be ignored you know i mean i think he's got he's got some demons that he had he has to exercise yeah. and i don't say that in a pa in a patronizing way you know but right you know that's that's part of his his narrative Mm, that reminds me of speaking of, of Choron. I read recently that his mother told him she should have aborted him. And so he, you know, maybe that influenced his pessimistic outlook. Or well, his, I, apparently he was very that, close to being aborted as well. I don't know if you knew that, but yeah. Carlin? Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, so apparently like... It was two months into his mother's pregnancy and they were absolutely ready to abort and then she saw a painting the mother saw a painting where she saw her mother in the painting and she saw it as a sign that maybe they should give it a shot and uh so yeah but mm. he, he's clearly very aware where of did that. you see that um i watched like an unauthorized documentary um on carlin which is made up 100 percent of just his words basically so it's just a bunch of he's sitting on a couch talking to an interviewer for pbs or something possibly because but again i was just kind of playing it in my headphones you know i start to press play and then don't watch but just listen i see i think yeah. i think i've seen part of that if not all of it but i don't remember that part yeah that, yeah, specifically that's specifically talking uh... about abortion yeah interesting mm -hmm. well there's another parallel between uh carlin and choron maybe you'll give him another chance but uh i, I, I thought of a, a few other quotes in relation to carlin okay. uh so i thought of this quote from samuel beckett okay ever tried ever failed no matter try again fail again fail better okay why i'm i'm wondering can we not say that despite Carlin's misanthropy and nihilism, he has what, you know, Gramsci would call pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. If he didn't, if he didn't, why would he bother to make another special? I mean, he was constantly working. His work was his life. You know, his purpose in life was to develop an hour's worth of material and share it with an audience if he were completely nihilistic and completely misanthropic why would he bother to do that and you could ask the same question of choran why would he bother to write and beckett as well you know who said something like there's there's nothing to express no possibility of expressing anything and yet at the same time there's this duty to try to express to to fail again and fail better yeah and I, and I think what you said earlier about it being a persona is like massively important as well because yeah I've seen interviews with him where he's he's considerably more mellow um, 
more polite and uh yeah and and takes the and is very open about how how much joy he gets from his work and uh and and just the way that he describes his life but just generally like the tone of his voice was, is very different in certain contexts so yeah yeah well i've heard him also say that like when you interact with a human being one-on-one -on -one, you know, you, you talk to someone as an individual, you can see, he actually said something like you can see the, the spirit or the, the soul in their eyes, you know, and this is a beautiful thing. But when people get together in groups, they become complete assholes and humanity in the mass is something that he fears and despises but individual human beings you know he he sees the the beauty and maybe even feels something like love towards them yeah again that must be from the the non-stand-up persona because uh i think in the in the special you had us listen to <clears throat> it's bad for you he, he says like how he loves people, despite what people may think, and he can handle them for up to about a minute and a half. <laughs> and people are fucking boring. Let me take it in a different direction. Sure. Uh, since we both recently listened to Life is Worth Losing, the opening bit is remarkable. It's called A Modern Man. And he walks out on the stage and he delivers a... I don't know what you would call it. Is it poetry? Is it a spoken word performance? Is it a rap? I mean, language is very important to what he does, right? His sensitivity to language is sure. And I think is, the word poetry uh, is very important there as well because of just how much, how much he memorizes, and he memorizes it because it kind of needs to be memorized because it's, it's not language that's just formulated in sentences, but it's like phrases that he puts together like you know language that he joins together lots of that i mean it's it's like shell silverstein on steroids or something <laughs> that's an interesting way to describe it well it's it's uh but I can mean, you remind me like about this opening monologue the content of it uh well he you know he's using all of these he's basically accumulating all of these phrases that the the media uh bombards us with you know right like like uh i can't think of any at the moment but you know how but no yeah for sure you're like top up top down top through top yeah like stuff like that right where it's just like bouncy and yeah right but it but it's it's all of these uh it's this terminology that is part of our, our part of our cultural zeitgeist i guess you could say but but like a a mainstream crass commercial dumbed down uh version of the american language i guess i mean i've got a little bit here it says like uh, i'm a modern man a man for the millennium Digital and smoke-free, a diversified, multicultural, postmodern deconstruction that is anatomically and ecologically incorrect. I've been uplinked and downloaded. I've been inputted and outsourced. I know the upside of downsizing. I know the downside of upgrading, and so on. Yes, that's it. I mean, th okay, language is always very important to what he does, but this this would be like the best example of of his linguistic facility his, right. his poetic capabilities i mean it's incredible it is it is it would require so much effort in terms of the memorization process i mean obviously if you get to a point as a professional actor you're you get good at, at memorizing stuff but uh mm -hmm. but it was obviously something that must have consumed his life in terms of just rehearsing 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 and i also heard that he didn't even do much stand-up so this is pretty much like a solo experience and then he, his performances were often just like the specials you know oh yeah i heard that he would he would go work 
the comedy clubs and sometimes it'd be very raw and he'd be out there maybe i'm confusing him with someone else but i thought he was no you're right he did to some extent out there with a notepad just just uh throwing things out there yeah seeing what worked and then developing his hour or hour and a half or whatever from that I guess I heard conflicting things, and I also heard that at comedy clubs he would be like, "Fuck comedy clubs," <laughs> stuff like that. Like I don't mm. need them. So yeah. Anyway. Well, I think it'd be interesting to watch a set of his or any of the greats. It'd be interesting to watch a set that bombed. You know. I. Yeah, I Joe like... Rogan mentions a set that he saw or that his friends saw that he bombed in. Apparently. Yeah. Well, actually. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, we probably the description the of it. Clip. Well, the description of it didn't sound like a bomb to me. I think I would have enjoyed it, but maybe, maybe the the rest of the audience didn't get it or they didn't like it or whatever. I, those are interesting moments to me. Like I, I enjoy going to comedy clubs and seeing bad comedians. It's still funny to me, still entertaining, sure. and I still respect the fact that they get up there and try, even if. You know, it's not the most brilliant material or the or the most masterful delivery. It's it's almost always entertaining. Do you ever go to comedy clubs? Sure, yeah. In Taiwan. I did uh yes. Uh I I have some friends here that do stand up. I mean they haven't recently because of this COVID bullshit, but before the pandemic, uh yeah. There, there are several clubs. I've been to several events. There, there was a storytelling event I used to go to as well. You know, wasn't stand up, but a lot of the stories were quite humorous. Mm-hmm. What about back and in Texas? Still, yeah, in in Houston, back in my college days, I I did go see some stand up. But you know, I would go see any kind of show, whether it was musical or theatrical right comedy i uh, i always like to see performance it's interesting how kind of joe rogan is kind of even though he's not he's not someone i'd particularly want be interested in seeing in terms of his own stand-up material but he's definitely like uh introduced me or made me think more about the world of stand-up just because of how often he has stand-up comedians on and yeah, you just learn about the culture more. It is obviously is a culture, and it's a massive like. Uh, it's a network, right? That the comedians have with one another, and. Yeah, it's it's just something that. I've never really been someone who went to stand up shows, but um. But it is significant. I mean, coming back full circle to the role of the comedian in society, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, are we uh have we depleted the uh possibly. I mean, I can I can ask you what you think of like the emerging can we something we come back to like the Jimmy Dore Russell Brand vein, this kind of like merger of politics and comedy. We can maybe discuss that in a future episode because I think maybe it deserves its own episode. Mhm. But yeah, uh, let's do that. It's worth it's worth exploring. All right. What are we doing next? So next we're going to be reading a short story by Gogol, Nikolai Gogol, called The Overcoat. I think both of us have already read it, but we're going to revisit it. And uh, as you know, I'll be moving to St. Petersburg, if all goes well, in the autumn. And it uh, kind of belongs to Gogol's St. Petersburg repertoire. And uh, it'll make you feel the brisk, cold wind of uh, St. Petersburg winter. So should be good crack, as they say in England. Sounds good. Yeah, man. All right. Well, peace for now. And see you on the next episode. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Texting.